This is our first staging post. We've only just set off yeah. on today's peak bagging expedition. <laughs> Karen, Dan, set the scene for us and tell us what you've got planned for today. We're going up Suter Fell, just a small hill sitting above Mangrysdale and below Blencathra. It's a really good hill because it's nice and low level, so any weather, though today's obviously a beautiful day, we could have been higher. And it's part of the Blencathra Massif walk in the book, which takes in all of the fells around here. And this is the first hill on that walk. You're treating us gently this morning there. <laughs> and my goodness, we haven't gone very far and we've already got a gorgeous view down into the valley and so far towards the Mells as yes, well. Mel Fells there, yes, and there's Acot Hill Nature Reserve over there. That's an area that we go orienteering on, which is good. They've been developing that for wildlife and you can walk around that as well. So it's, it's, it's Cumbria Wildlife Trust. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. spent quite a lot of time at Icot Hill have, as have well. You, yeah, I have yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've got belted Galloway cattle on there. And That's right, yes, yes. <laughs> the, the Marvellous boggy bits. Boggy bits, yes. Mm-hmm. Very, very rough for orienteering. We've got a friend who's responsible for counting cows, going and checking every other day if they're all still there and everything. I've been in very safe hands this morning as well because of your orienteering backgrounds, very illustrious <laughs> orienteering backgrounds, if I may say, as well. And one thing that struck me looking at the book is I get that sense of, of orienteers behind it in a good way. Oh, nice well, d- well, just because of the, I suppose, the amount of detail that's in there to do with roots and features and timings. And how much did your orienteering background come into play when you were putting the book together, do you feel? I think... Possibly it means we're more likely than some people to take non-standard routes, perhaps. We're more likely to look at a map and think, oh, I wonder if you can get up there. I wonder if that would be a nice way to go, rather than just taking the established route. Following the received wisdom. Yes. Yes. And also sort of with orienteering, you navigate quite well. Just knowing what's important to keep people on track and things like that. Because you can't possibly describe in any walk everything that you do but it's a matter of identifying the important things like where we are now you take the little path off to the left for example it's things like that it's fascinating how how you've put this all together and what's also intriguing me is what the motivation was for this book because this is your first foray into published territory this hasn't been a five minute job this has taken a lot of planning a lot of research a lot of walking Really, we actually asked to do it by the publishers, Stephen Ross. We know him quite well through the Saunders Lakeland Mountain Marathon, which we are involved in the organisation of, and he is as well. So he knew that we were people who know the mountains very well and like finding interesting routes and things like that. Karen's brother, Steve, Steve Birkinshaw, broke the Wainwrights record five or six years ago, was it? Probably more now. Yeah, probably a bit more. It's it's since been broken again, but he was the first of the modern, or the current people, because he broke with Joss Nay record which was a long-standing record and so I guess that's partly why Stephen asked us as well because he knew that we helped. You were of assistance. We were of yes. assistance and helped devise the route a little bit. Steve did most of it himself but also supported him on it. Mm. So yeah. of course the Wainwright's very familiar to you but yeah. I suppose when you were helping Steve that was a slightly different challenge of a slightly different character because clearly with Steve what you were looking for was the optimum route to yes. save him time to save him energy to break that record yeah, yeah. And to keep the right speed up and feed him as well because that's one of the things when you're supporting people on long distance things is you've got to stop take the food out of your rucksack and then you've got to sprint to catch up and feed them and so it was really quite taxing all those for logistics us. Yeah, 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 yeah aside from the routes themselves yeah. I suppose then for this your raison d'etre is different because you're not out to break records what you're out is to give people the pathways to the best possible experience yes our brief really was to create walks which are going to take about eight hours for us it's not particularly fast walker but a good long day walk to cover all the way in rights without any repetition and break it down like that which is quite hard to work out. We sort of think, oh, that's a nice route. Oh, but that one's left out over there. Oh, well, if we change that, we can put that in. But then that's got too long. And you can just imagine the, the it's spread out and you'd start with one thing and it would have an effect. A knock on 20 effect miles on away, else. yes. Yes, yes. And of course, it's not just about spreading out maps. It's about the actual doing of it and yes, working yes. out the practicalities. Yes, that's right. I think, fortunately, we know the fells very well. So when we were devising the routes, we had a pretty good idea where we wanted people to go. 
but it was actually some of the lower fells, the ones that we had, the Reque Moor. Certainly in the South Lakes, the routes around Tarn House and things like that, we're a bit less familiar with that, and, and the routes between some of the hills there, we had to investigate a bit, whereas a lot of the fells we just sort of knew anyway. So an interesting blend of familiarity and discovery yeah, by well, the yes, sounds yeah, of it. Yes. yes, it did take us places we hadn't ever been before, which is nice. Some of the small hills like Home Fell, just near Coniston, exploring that with all of the old quarries and everything there. And while you might not like the man-made scars on the landscape, they're absolutely fascinating and the history behind them. And there's some really, really impressive things around there that you come across that you wouldn't imagine, really. It sounds to me like you've been on a real adventure as well, in all sorts of ways. Good. Yes, definitely enjoyable. Well, you better leave me on. We're going left here, going then, left. are we? Yes, we start to get up onto the ridge. Rather a lovely snake-like path, yes, winding right. up between yeah. this lovely rusty bracken at this time of year. Right, we'll yeah. lead on then. OK. Well, not exactly a surprise view as we turn this corner, but, my goodness, if we look behind us, how the vista's opened up... Yes, that's right. ...without coming very far, you don't really appreciate till you get up here how flat this valley is. No, it is, isn't it? A mixture of green fields and some rougher land as well. Yeah. Some wonderful geometric patterns it is with the amazing. walls, They're aren't they? Really straight. I've yes. always wondered how they managed to make them so straight, but it's just amazing, isn't it? And the hedges as well. And we've got that sort of winter haze over there with that's the sun attempting. That's right, yes. And to break through it. And there's Gow Barrow. Further left, you can see, I think that's Hooska Hill over there, which is on the sort of area up above Ascombe, which is another one of our favourite haunts. And then, and sort then of the surprise the, is, the it is slightly still glowering in the dark with hints of snow still. That's Bowscale Fell up there. And then the Tongue, I think that's called. We were up there just last week, weren't we? There was a bit more snow around then. There's a nice steep ascent up that craggy sort of end there. We usually get the uh, yeah. airborne yeah. accompaniment. Yeah. Two fighters up there, yes. Which I expect is something that you are quite used to. It's all part of what they need to do, I guess. And it's really strange when you're really high up, when you can actually look down on them. I mean, from here we're looking up at them. But it's amazing if you're on top on the tops and then they're flying through the valleys. It's really quite a sight and really quite a shock sometimes. Quite yeah. uncanny, really. Yeah. The thing that strikes me about here is the different characteristics from the view behind us and that in front of us. There's something about these Col Becky fells that's different. Yes, I agree. They're not as dramatic, certainly, as the centrals. We just really like them. There's a nice quiet feeling to the shawl, isn't there? Even in summer, it stays peaceful. The shapes and everything and the play of light on them as well. And sometimes if you were up on Bowscale now, you would have no sun at all. Certainly down at Bowscale Tarn, down the other side, I don't know if that ever gets any sun. It's, it always seems to be shrouded in darkness, doesn't it? And then, of course, there are the legends attached <laughs> with Bowscale as the fish. With Sauterfell, isn't this where the spectral army was supposed to Ooh, have marched? Dear, well, that's a new one on that. Oh, <laughs> no, 1745. Right. 26 people witnessed cavalry on the fell and no one has any explanation for it. There were no prints. There's vague theories to right. do with the 45 Rebellion and oh, Bonnie goodness. Prince Charlie, but... We'll have to look at that, well, look that up. Well, we did try to find out, certainly as the main point, so where you went past, like Hartsock Hall or something like that, we tried to find facts about things. We missed that one, I must say. Well, yeah. you can't be utterly comprehensive when no. you're covering over 200 <laughs> <Yes>. peaks <laughs> and 45 different routes as well. And the whole point of the way that you've done it is to devise circular routes, which is a funny thing, this, isn't it? Because a lot of people don't like coming back the same way they went. There's something definitely there? about re yeah. having to yeah. retrace yes. your steps. Yeah. Yes, I don't like it, but we've got friends who absolutely refuse to do it. I don't think any of our routes have very duplication, no. more than two or 300 metres yeah. at the end or yeah. something. Yeah. I think this ranks as the most spectacular site so far. Again, ascending a bit more, bit more of a kink in the path and then you come round and there is Saddleback in all its gorgeous glory yeah, today. With, with the snow still nestling along the top ridge. Against yeah. the blue sky. I should say Blencathra of course because technically these days. Yes that's right. I grew up knowing it as Saddleback. I think Wainwright promoted the name Blencathra and that definitely seems to have been adopted. It's now the de facto name for it. It's spectacular. Against that blue sky and then we were just noticing on the way up weren't we? The weird way that the snow sticks to certain bits. Where the flat land suddenly drops away, you get that line of snow coming down the gullies. 
on Bannerdale Crags there. It's a really it's very boggy just above there, but this face is really very attractive. Beautiful shape, that. Yeah, they? yeah. And we've gone from looking down onto those really geometric shapes of the walls to now all these almost like craters yeah, and the shadows right, yeah. in them and the different colours of the yeah, russety the bracken. bracken. is fantastic, isn't it? This, this time of year with the sun shining on it and then the contrast against the heather as well. It's lost its purple, but it's still a nice contrast. And maybe, do you think that's maybe part of the charm of some of these smaller fells? Yeah, maybe they don't offer as much in terms of adventure or technical problems or, or sheer exertion, but the view that you have of other fells, it's spectacular, isn't it? I think that's a, a really good point. It's a sort of well-established fact that it's the lower hills which often give you the best views, because well, you can look up, can't you? You're standing on top of something at all, and you can see below you, but you don't get the views of the other mountains. Mm-hmm. Definitely something as you said for low fells. And it's really nice here because we've got all these different tongues coming off. There's obviously Bow Scale Fell then. Well, that was actually called the tongue there. And then the ridge coming off Bannerdale Crags, which is quite a nice route up that. It looks quite steep. Well, it is quite steep and rocky, but there's a nice path up there which yeah, leads. Some interesting mining. Yeah, some old mining stuff just there. And it's really nice. It pops straight out, literally at the top, which is quite rare you know quite often you climb up and then you've got to wander and find the top whereas that path pops out and the top is literally just there and we're approaching the top here are we of Sutafel, yes, yes it's not far up here it's one of those which is quite hard to know which is the actual top because it's a long ridge with a few bumps on there's two definite things that you think well is that the top is that the top and that was one of the things when we were writing the book that was interesting because sometimes the highest point isn't the Wainwright top either the Alderman survey maps weren't quite right when Wainwright was looking at them or he thought mm, I don't really fancy that we'll go for this it's got much better view so that's my top so making sure that we got the right tops was quite time consuming both looking at his books and also then other people have been looking at this because sometimes the characters of the tops change or Cairn might disappear or a new one might appear and things like that so it was quite an interesting exercise that yes, yeah. yes quite a contentious issue which is the right summit and how do you decide we decide the, the way you have to know is in the Wainwright books there's always a little black triangle where he actually decides but even trying to work out where that relates to how things look now and yeah. took quite a lot of time and once or twice there are two black triangles oh are there right? yes <laughs> you just say well go to both in that case it's probably the best yeah. thing you know and some people just don't care I mean logically you just want to get out and have a nice day don't you but there are certainly people who are quite obsessive about getting the right place and I think when Steve did his record round he really did have to get to the right top because otherwise... Null and void. Well, it's got to be defined somehow, hasn't it? You can't say, oh, well, it's near enough. It saved me ten minutes, but it's near enough. That wouldn't do. So are we going to be of the near enough school today or are we going to be very precise? I I think we're going to go over several so that we can't possibly be wrong. (laughs) A bit less windy here. So we think the top has been reached. Uh, is this a general consensus? Blinking, you'd miss it, mind. <laughs> well, it's certainly not a cairn, no. It's, yeah. it's a bit of bare rock. But we're fairly confident that this is the high point and it's what Wainwright drew in his books. And there is a fair reward. I mean, I've got to say, your effort reward ratio for this particular fell <laughs> is heavily stacked in favour of reward yeah. isn't it my it, goodness well, we've only been walking i don't know half an hour maybe a bit more views across the eden vale the pennines cross fell in the distance there you can't quite see oldswater you can see where oldswater is just beyond galbar and then some of the the higher fells over there it's just fantastic and then the twin peaks a blank Cathra behind yes, it. Yes, indeed. Yes. All triangular yes, and yeah. angular. The sharp edge going up to the right hand end there. It's almost a 360, isn't it? It's absolutely stunning, even with that little bit of winter haze that we've got today. As the detail that you can see just sort of disappears, so the Pennines just look a grey line in the distance, but it's still quite atmospheric. We've made it down from that windswept well what we decided was the summit it yes, wasn't that yes. obvious was it <laughs> it certainly wasn't no and as we've come down we've still got it almost feels like we could reach out and touch it does look incredibly close it? doesn't it sharp yes. edge up there it's been a stunning round that you have taken me on so far and we're about to descend into shadow yes. aren't we which is why we've stopped here <laughs> I, thought, actually. I think once we're around the corner, it will probably get. We can get, get back get out, out into the sunshine. Yeah. For you, what is the lure of 
the Wainwrights because they have become such a thing. So many people, they're on their list of things to do. It's such a, maybe a doable challenge for a lot of people. Do you think that's maybe it? <laughs> Some that. We've never actually set off to do the Wainwrights. We always wanted to do the Munros. We did those, finished them in about 15 years ago, and then started on the Corbetts, and we've done most of those as well. A few on islands left. But until the book came along, we never actually thought about doing all the Wainwrights. So we started looking at the lists and found that there's about four or five we'd probably never been up. And actually, you know, the first time we did them was in writing the book. So an opportunity for you as well. Yeah. Though sadly we've still not done one because we went to the wrong top. We realised we were wrecking one of the walks and we went round and then we got back and then when we were writing it all up we thought, oops, because we'd been to the wrong top. It was one of these ones where the high point isn't the actual Wainwright top. Something called Low Fell above Low's Water. So we still haven't been to all the Wainwrights yet. We'll have to go back it's there sometime. It's definitely on the list for this year, isn't yeah. it? It's interesting, isn't it, how the more distance there's been between us and him, it almost seems to be burned in yes. popularity. I think, that's right. I think what you said there about how they're actually accessible for a lot of people, whereas if you want to do the Munros, that's a fair commitment and you've got some very, very long days. Whereas you can actually do the Wainwrights with never having to go more than five miles, maybe. Plenty of climb, but it's a lot more achievable, so I think that's got something to do with it. Well, it's obviously closer to the main centres of population, being the Lake District as well. And in terms of time, I suppose it's something you can fit in, like you say, in a day's schedule or whatever it intrigues me this whole business of timing because it's something that you do cover in the book and I really love the way you do it as well because you look at different times for different types of walker slash trail runner for different paces really because everybody is different most books they say this will take about eight hours six hours whatever it is and almost certainly it won't be right all it is is an indication whereas in our book it's got the tables of things and so hopefully after doing one of the two of the routes, people will think, well, I'm in between, or then they can hopefully get a reasonable idea about how long things take. In orienteering, you're making route choices, like do I go over this hill, do I go round it, or do I fight my way through that rhododendron, or whatever it might be, to try and gauge what the fastest route is. So we do have a reasonable concept of different speeds and things. Well, yeah. I suppose the other thing is we do quite a lot of planning of orienteering courses, so we're very conscious that you need a much, much shorter course for your 60-year-old women from your 21-year-old men. So we're conscious of the huge difference in speeds that people can go. That probably did come into it a little bit, didn't it? We're very used to thinking about different age groups and different speeds of people. So what's the joy of route planning for you? Because there are different sorts of route planning and we've touched on that already, whether you're aiming to get somewhere the fastest and the straightest or whatever. But this particular type of route planning that's gone into this book, what's the challenge of it? What's the joy of it? What keeps you motivated to keep looking for better routes? I think partly just the excitement of being somewhere you haven't been before is one of the things. And just looking around thinking, oh, I wonder what would happen if you went up that ridge? Would it be nice? Would it be really rocky? Could we have found a really nice grassy bit that we've never been on before? We've always looked at maps and thought, oh, we could try that today and see what that's like.